In this video, we are going to be discussing poker math that you need to know to succeed at poker. I know a lot of people tell me that they are not good at math or they don't even want to consider studying the math, but math is important, at least the math that impacts your strategy. What a lot of people get bogged down on is nonsense. They want to know how often four of a kind loses to a straight flush or a royal flush, which does not really matter. They want to know how often does pocket aces lose to the 9-4 offsuit four hands in a row. Does not matter. They want to know how often you get dealt pocket aces twice in a row. Does not matter. All of these things that people are concerned with are irrelevant. Like most things in life. So you want to make sure that you focus on and get very good at the things that actually do impact your overall poker strategy. So in this video, we're going to be discussing five concepts. The first is how to make a pot-sized raise before the flop, because that is very often going to be a good starting point for how much you should be raising initially. We're also going to be discussing pot odds, which help you know if you should stick around in a hand or not when you're facing a bet. We're also going to be discussing how to play a balanced range on the river when you are betting so that you make your opponent indifferent to calling, which will allow you to win the pot on average. You'll do that by making your range have a proportion of value bets to bluffs equal to the odds that your opponent is getting. We'll discuss that. I realize it's a little bit difficult, but it is important. We'll also be discussing the required bluff success frequency when you are making a bet, as well as the minimum defense frequency, how often you need to stick around when you are facing a bet so your opponent cannot just blindly run you over with aggression. So five topics here. It's going to be a long video, but these are five things that you really do need to know if you want to succeed at poker. So let's first discuss a pot size bet or a pot size raise. You're going to find that a pot-sized bet or raise is a good starting point before the flop because it doesn't give your opponent amazing odds to stick around while still not forcing you to risk so much money to win so little, which is what a lot of people do when they raise to seven big blinds before the flop. So what is a pot-sized raise? A pot-sized raise is three times the last bet plus any additional money that is in the pot. So we have three examples here. Let's say someone makes it three big blinds before the flop. Well, you take three times the last bet, which is three big blinds, plus the big blind plus the small blind, which equals 10.5 big blinds. So if you're playing a one, two, no limit game and your opponent makes it $6, you're going to make it $21 over their raise if you decided you wanted to re-raise. If there's an ante in play, you'd want to make it a little bit bigger. What about versus a two big blind raise and a six big blind three bet? Well, now you have six times three, which is 18 plus the two big blind raise, plus the one big blind, big blind, and the half a big blind, small blind. Now we have a 21.5 big blind re-raise. What about against a two big blind raise, a six big blind, three bet, a 15 big blind, four bet? Well, 15 times three is 45, plus six is 51, plus 3.5, which is 54.5 big blinds total. It's a big re-raise, but that is what you want to be doing a lot of the time. Now, this is a pot size raise, but in general, you're going to want to raise even a little bit larger as stacks get very deep. And alternatively, as stacks get shallower, you're going to want to raise a little bit less than a pot size raise because you don't need to necessarily raise a lot before the flop to make the pot humongous by the river if you're playing shallow because you just don't have that much money to put in by the river anyway. Also, you're going to find that you want to raise a little bit bigger when you are out of position against the player you're most likely to be against. And you're going to want to raise a little bit smaller when you are likely to be in position against the player you're likely to be playing against. Also, if a raise would put in more than 30% of your stack, you should usually go all in instead. This will become very important in tournaments when you're starting to get somewhat shallow stacked, or if you're putting in like a five bet preflop in a cash game, you usually just want to be all in in, some, in those spots. So here we have a chart uh, listing common raise sizes and re-raise sizes. We have stack depth over here. If you're listening to this on a podcast, check out the YouTube channel, this is very important youtube.com slash poker coaching. So let's say we do have 60 to 125 big blinds or perhaps even a little bit deeper. When they fold to you and you want to raise, you should make it about 2.75 big blinds, which is a little bit less than a pot size raise. When someone limps, you're going to want to make it about 4.5 big blinds, which is a pot size raise. When someone raises in front of you, you're going to want to make it about three times their bet or their raise amount when you are in position, which is a little bit less than a pot size raise and four times the amount when you are out of position, when you're in the small blind or the big blind. And that's a little bit more than a pot size raise. You see all these concepts we were discussing earlier, just a second ago, are coming into effect here. 
When you are facing a three bet, so say you raise and someone re-raises you and it's back to you, if you're in position, you're going to want to make it about 2.75 times the three bet amount and from out of position about 3.25 times the three bet amount. These are common spots that come up all the time. And once you know how much to make it in these scenarios, that's one less thing you have to think about. And ideally, these five things that we're going to be discussing today, the poker math you need to know, if you can get all of these down to where you just know what to do, you can focus on, well, actually playing good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. So it's one less thing you have to be concerned with. Let's discuss pot odds. When you are facing a bet, you have to risk some amount to win some other amount. You have to risk the amount that the bet is to win the bet plus the pot, plus you also get back your bet that you would have called when you do happen to win. And if you will win more than the pot odds dictate you need to win, then you should continue. And if you will win less often than the pot odds dictate you should continue, then you should fold. This is a bit of an oversimplification. I realize equity realization is a thing, but this is definitely what you want to be thinking about when you are learning about pot odds. Now, at least as far as I can tell, most people do not think in terms of odds. They think in terms of percentages. I know I literally never think in terms of odds. Pot odds are traditionally expressed as the amount you can win to the amount you risk. So, for example, say your opponent bets 100 into 100 pots. Okay, you have to call 100 to win 200, right? You have to put in the, the 100 that you're putting in to win the pot plus their bet to 200. This would give you two to one odds. That's how you would say this. This is actually 200 to 100. You lop off both the hundreds here to simplify it. It gives you two to one odds. But how often do you need to win if you're getting two to one odds? A lot of people think it's 50%, but that is horribly incorrect. To convert odds to a percentage, you need to divide the second number by the first number plus the second number. So let's do that. Second number divided by second number plus the first number. Second number here is 100, or 1. 100 divided by 100 plus 200 equals 1 third, which is 33%. So when you are facing a pot size bet, you need to win 33% of the time, which makes sense. You're putting in literally one third of the whole pot, right? You're putting in one third of the whole pot, you need to get back a third of the whole pot in order to break even. If you'll get back less than that, it's not good for you. If you'll get back more than that, it's really good for you. Let's go through an example or two. Let's say your opponent bets 100 into a 400 pot. This gives you four to one odds. Let's convert that into a percentage. Well, we have the second number divided by the second number plus the first number. So 100 divided by 100 plus 400 equals 20%. If we're going to realize more than 20% equity in this scenario, we should be sticking around. Let's do another one. Let's say the opponent bets 1,500 into the 8,000 pot. Well, now it's 1,500 to win 9,500, which is 9,500 to 1,500. You can simplify this by dividing 9,500 9, by 1,500, which is 6.3 to 1, if you wanted to simplify it. But that is, again, 1,500 divided by 1,500 plus 9,500, which equals 13.6%. If you realize more than 13.6% equity, you got to be sticking around. Worth noting, bet size matters a lot when you are considering pot odds. As you face smaller bet sizes, you should be continuing far more often. And as you're facing large bet sizes, you should be considering far less often. This is actually the opposite of what a lot of people do if you consider small stakes cash games. So many people make it eight big blinds before the flop, and then you'll see six people call them. But that's a horrible mistake because you're risking a lot to win almost nothing. You're getting bad pot odds. In tournaments, you'll see people making 20% pot bets on the flop and their opponents fold out half of their range or more. It's a disaster. You can't be doing that. And, well, it's because people don't fully understand how pot odds work and how that should heavily impact your strategy. Here's some common pot odds we have. When you are getting 4 to 1, you need to realize at least 20% equity. When you're getting 3 to 1, you need to realize 25%. When you're getting two to one, which is when your opponent makes a pot size bet, you need to realize 33% equity. When you're getting 1.5 to one, you need to realize 40% equity. If you're getting one to one, which doesn't really happen all that often, but sometimes it does, you need to realize 50% equity. All right, now let's discuss balanced river value to bluff proportions. This is a bit of a 
interesting topic that definitely does matter. And I think a lot of people don't really consider it when it comes to thinking about a good, strong balanced poker strategy. If you bet the river with a perfectly polarized range, meaning you either are betting with a really good hand that basically always wins or a bluff that basically always loses when your opponent calls, your opponent will be indifferent with all of their bluff catchers, meaning their hand doesn't really matter because they lose to all of your value hands and they beat all of your bluffs. And very often, if you bet the flop and the turn and the river, most players will be in that scenario where they have a bluff catcher and your range should be very polarized. So in this spot, to have a balanced range, you want to have a number of combinations in your range that are bluffs equal to how often your opponent needs to win based on the pot odds. Okay? This concept is super important when you do take a line where you should be very polarized. Just be sure that all of your value bets actually win when you do get called. What a lot of people do wrong here is they have thin value bets in their big betting range on the river that results in them value betting too thinly. And then you need to have fewer bluffs in your range to account for that. So let's consider various bet sizes. Let's say on the river you bet 50% pot. Let's just presume we're all in for this video. Let's say you're all in for 50% pot. In this scenario, your opponent needs to win. Let's do, figure out their pot odds, right? Like we just discussed. They have to put in 0.5 to win your 0.5 bet, their 0.5 call, and the one big uh, the, the one full pot. So this is 0.5 divided by two, which is 25%. Your opponent needs to win 25% of the time in this scenario. So if your opponent needs to win 25% of the time, that means that you want to structure your river 50% pot all in range such that it contains 25% bluffs. Very important topic. A lot of people in this scenario bluff far too often. It's easy to bluff more than 25% of the time, especially when a bunch of draws miss. And well, all your opponent has to do if you're bluffing more than 25% of the time is call with all their bluff catchers and they are going to absolutely crush you. Let's say you can bet 100% pot. You're all in for a pot size bet. In this scenario, your opponent needs to win one divided by the pot plus your pot size bet plus their pot size call, right? One divided by three is 33%. So you need to have 33% bluffs in your range in the scenario to make your opponent indifferent between calling or folding. If you bet two times the pot, hmm, now your opponent needs to win two divided by two plus two plus one, which is 40% of the time, which means you need to have 40% bluffs in your range. A lot of people, when they 2x pot the river, have far too few bluffs in their range. You're going to find that most people in most games, when they over pot the river, two times pot have almost no bluffs in their range. And this results in them being horribly unbalanced because then all your opponent has to do is just fold everything. Life's easy if all you have to do is fold everything because your opponent doesn't bluff enough. If you make a three times pot bet all in on the river, your opponent now needs to win 43% of the time based on the pot odds. And well, you get to have 43% bluffs, which like I said, a lot of people do not do. This is however, what you see a lot of the best players in the world do when they make these large over bets on the river, especially with a good blocker to the best possible hand available. Like say there's three spades on the board and you have the ace of spades in your hand. That's a great spot to bluff and you can bluff for a huge amount because first, you know, your opponent doesn't have the ace I flush and you know, you get to bluff a lot when you're making these big all in bet sizes. Let's discuss about your acquired bluff success frequency. A lot of people kind of get this confused with pot odds, but it is not the same thing. When you are bluffing, if your bluff wins more than your bet divided by your bet plus the pot, you profit immediately. This presumes your bluff has 0% equity, by the way. Very often when you are bluffing, you're going to win sometimes, right? Like say you bet the flop with one over card, right? If sometimes that one over card makes top pair and it wins. So let's say you bet 25% pot. Let's say you bet 25% pot on the flop. Remember how I discussed a second ago, a lot of the best players raise pre-flop and then bet tiny on the flop and their opponent folds too often. Well, here you profit if your opponent folds more than 0.25 divided by 0.25 plus one. So the 25% pot bet plus the pot equals 20%. In this scenario, if your opponent will fold more than 20% of the time, you immediately profit, assuming your hand literally never, ever wins, which it will sometimes. So your opponent needs to defend actually much more than this, right? I mean, they so here, if they fold more than 20%, they're going to get crushed. But they have to stick around wider to account for the fact that, you know, sometimes you're going to end up winning with whatever nonsense you have. So this is a spot 
where making this small bet is going to be incredibly profitable for you if your opponents are going to fold out stuff like gut shot straight draws and backdoor flush draws with an overcard and stuff like that, which a lot of people will. If you bet 50% pot, you profit if your opponent folds more than 0.5 divided by 0.5 plus 1, which is 33%. A lot of people don't even stick around 67% of the time. It's, it's hard to do. If you bet pot, you profit if your opponent folds more than half of the time. Against the pot size bet on the flop, you're going to find that most people fold out way more than half the time. They fold out like 70% of the time, making, again, that immediately profitable. And if you 2x pot it, you profit if your opponent folds more than 67% of the time. Now, once you start 2x potting it, your opponent really doesn't have to stick around all that often at all, so you have to be a little bit careful going for very, very big bet sizes. But you're going to find an incredibly profitable strategy in most games against most players is to just continuation bet frequently and tiny because most people do not defend with 80% of their range which is, you know, to some extent required in these scenarios. Now, the opposite of the required bluff success frequency is the minimum defense frequency, which is one minus the bet divided by the bet plus the pot. So if your opponent bets 25% pot, minimum defense frequency is one minus 0 0.25 divided by 0 0.25 plus one, which is 80%, right? It's the opposite. It's, it's one minus this number we just did here. So you can go down the list to see all of this. And I think what ends up happening in this scenario is a lot of people do study minimum defense frequency and they think that in all scenarios, they do need to defend with, let's say, you know, 80% of their range against a small bet. But that's actually not true because sometimes you're going to do what is called or do what is referred to as under-realizing your equity. For example, say someone raises and you call in the big blind with nine, five suited and the flop comes ace, king, five, right? In the spot, if you check in your opponent bets, it's already pretty rough. Maybe you stick around, maybe you don't. But on the turn, say the turn's a 10. You check in your opponent bets, you should probably fold your bottom pair, right? But your bottom pair is going to win some portion of the time that you do not get to realize. So you're going to end up under-realizing your equity in these scenarios. So when there are additional betting rounds, you don't actually have to defend as often as the minimum defense frequency dictates because you're going to drastically under-realize your equity with a lot of your medium strength hands. So definitely keep that in mind. However, these numbers are especially relevant as you get to the river against good, strong, balanced players because, well, you want to make sure you're not drastically overfolding. If all your opponent has to do to crush you is simply bet, you're going to lose. So you want to make sure that you develop good, strong defense strategies so that you can combat players who are good and aggressive. And once you learn to do this and you learn to protect your ranges by check calling with a lot of medium strength hands, you know you just don't plan to fold, it's going to make you way more difficult to play against compared to if you just always raise those hands on the flop or you always fold all of your bluff catchers on the river when your opponent does put you to the test for a lot of chips. So I realize there is a decent amount of math in this video. This, uh, these are five things you definitely do need to know to succeed at poker. I have a fundamentals course that if you are kind of new to poker and a lot of this is a little bit rough to you or a little bit new to you, uh, that will be very beneficial for you to check out. You can get it completely for free at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. So make sure you check it out. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thank you for being here. If you have a friend who doesn't understand pot odds or minimum defense frequency or anything like that, send them this video. That'll go a long way to helping them out. If there's any other math that you think that people need to know or that you maybe want to see a video on, write it in the comment section down below. I'll be sure to read it. Also, when you're down there, click the like button, click the subscribe button, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.